My name is uh, Rob Kure. I'm a third year medical student at the University of Nairobi. And uh, today I'll be presenting to you a comparative study I did on the pelvic ureteric junction in man and rabbit. This was uh, part of my PC anatomy dissertation. So the pelvic ureteric junction is the most proximal constriction of the ureter. This we know from basic anatomy. And it's a frequent point of obstruction of, upper, of the upper urinary tract obstruction. Of these obstructions, there may be physical causes or functional causes. And um, the physical causes are basically known. We have stones, or we can have aberrant vessels. However, the functional obstruction, uh, which is referred to as the pelvic junction obstruction, its etiology is not well understood. However, defects in the muscularis and possibly the connective tissue affecting, uh, affecting the viscoelastic the visco properties of the junction have been implicated. But still, much is not known about the etiology. Next. So, to further understand the, the etiology of this obstruction, animal models are used frequently in trying, are frequently used to try and elucidate the pathophysiology of this entity. However, majority of the animal models are smaller mammals, such as rabbits and rats, which are uh, unicalicial renal systems. However, in man, we have a multicalicial collecting system. Uh, so just to clarify, a multicalicial collecting system is where we have several minor calices leading into calyxes and one major collecting pelvis, which leads to the ureter. However, in a unicalicial, we have a single papillae which is leads into a calyx which is continuous with the pelvis and the ureter. So there's no distinct uh, receptor called the pelvis that is seen in the multicalicial kidney. Next. So the UPJ or the pelvic tract junction, its role has been uh, quite contentious. There's, uh, there's no consensus as to whether it's really a sphincter and what its role is. Several physiological studies have been carried out. Uh, of this, Shafiq uh, elucidated uh, the role of the PUJ in control of urine flow from the renal pelvis into the ureter. He, he, he therefore came up with uh, these two mechanisms, the pelvic ureteric, uh, sorry, that's meant to be, uh, yeah, the pelvic ureteric inhibitory reflex, sorry, and the, and the ureter pelvic excitatory reflex. Basically, these reflexes uh, control the flow of urine from the renal pelvis into the ureter and prevent backflow of urine from the from the ureter into the pelvis, and this is protective. Also, uh, further studies have also been carried out on the unicalicial system to just to try and see how urine flows in these systems. These studies were carried out in the 80s by Schmidt and Leeson, and they did demonstrate that this back flow of urine in, in these unicalicial systems during high flow rates of urine. So, uh, at this point, we are seeing where there's some slight difference from a physiological standpoint in the structure in the PUJ. So, uh, so, so I decided, so I thought, is there any structural difference in this junction between a multicalicial kidney and a unicalicial kidney? <coughs> so this is why, so, so this, uh, so, so carrying out a study to see whether there are any structural differences will inform us whether these animal models that are used, whether they are truly uh, representative and whether we can extrapolate these findings from these smaller mammals into multicalicial kidneys in man. Next. So, uh, so I sort of to answer this question, whether there are any structural differences in the organization of the pelvic ureteric junction in man and rabbits. In doing so, I was uh, able to answer whether, to answer this question, I, will, I looked at the gross morphology as well as the microscopic organization focusing on the muscularis as well as the connective tissue organization, particularly in the elastic fiber organization at the transition. Next. So I carried out a comparative descriptive cross-sectional study, and, uh, I mean, and my material methods were as follows. So for the human specimen, I used 24 individuals. And the ureters were harvested at autopsy, and ethical approval was sought from the Kenyatta National Hospital and the University of Nairobi Ethical Review Committee and administrative information was sold from the Chomo funeral parlor where the autopsies were carried out. And of course, uh, consent from the relatives was sold. I only used uh, adults aged between 18 and 50 uh, years old, and uh, I excluded any kidneys that showed any visible pathology or anomaly. 
for the rabbit specimen, I used a similar number, 24, from New Zealand white uh, rabbits. Uh, and the color people was six sorts <coughs> from the animal care and use committees of our veterinary department. Uh, the rabbits were only sourced from uh, farmers licensed by the Rabbit Breed Association of Kenya. These uh, farmers uh, are, are trained and only breed pure breed New Zealand white rabbits. So I only use adult rabbits uh, aged between six to nine months and any rabbit, any kidneys that showed any urinary tract anomalies such as accessory kidneys was excluded. So uh, just a brief overview of what uh, I did. Uh, for the human specimen, the obvious autopsy, so a standard for incision was done for the normal autopsy, and uh, the visceral mobilized, and uh, the transition from the renal pelvis to the ureter was observed before the kidney was sexually longitudinal. Because I was examining from the gross aspects up to the microscopic aspects. Next, a similar thing was done for the rabbit, and here the rabbits were actually first euthanized and perfused with cell with the formosalum. Uh, before the dissection was done to expose the the kidneys and the collecting system. Next. So, uh, since I was observing the cross features, uh, to, to a very niche observer error, I enlisted two of my colleagues to to come and make the observations along with me. Next. So, uh, in order to get some quantification, I did some I did volume densities, which is serological uh, application to see to try and get proportions of smooth muscle as well as elastic fibers within the pelvic junction. Uh, that analysis was done using the EBJ, which enables me to do the volume densities, uh, means and some deviations were calculated and presented in pictures and line graphs. So, <clears throat> into the results, um, here we are seeing the human kidney and this is the rabbit kidney. Um, as you can see, the transition from the renal pelvis into the ureter is a tra the smooth transition. You can't really delineate and uh, pinpoint the pelvic junction. Uh, similar thing for the rabbit kidney. You just have a smooth transition. You can't, from the external, you can't really pinpoint the pelvic junction. Next. Uh, Intraluminal morphology is also observed. Uh, I slit open the the ureter from the renal pelvis into the ureter. And uh, here we are seeing folds which are quite uh, distinct and marked at the transition from the renal pelvis into the ureter. However, in the rabbit, which will not be so clear, but we see the, the folds are, are, are indeed there, but are just continuous with those in the ureter and don't seem to be distinct for the transition. Next. So uh, for the histomophobia thing, um, using uh, these are the longitudinal sections coming all the way from the renal pelvis to the ureter. This is man in the human uh, transition. So we are seeing at the renal pelvis uh, the muscular architecture is mainly oblique muscle, a smooth muscle. And as we get into the transition at the ureteropelvic junction, it is characterized by uh, thicker bundles of circular smooth muscle. So we can see a kind of a focal hypertrophy of smooth muscle at this point. And as you go down into the, into the ureter, we are seeing uh, the muscle, the, the circular smooth muscle density is decreased, and we start having a more distinct longitudinal layer of muscle here. Uh, in the rabbit, however, we see that the smooth muscle layer is very compact, and coming from the renal pelvis into the ureter, the muscle layer actually uh, decreases in, in its thickness, and we are not seeing any focal hypertrophy or indication or where there's any smooth muscle hypertrophy. So uh, using the volume densities, uh, calculating the means, uh, I was able to plot this uh, line graph demonstrating the smooth muscle proportions. So coming from the renal pelvis, this is in man, this is in rabbit, we see that there's a focal rise in the smooth, in the density of uh, smooth muscle at the area of the PPJ, of the PUJ, and this muscle density goes down as we go into the ureter. Uh, this, uh, however, in the rabbit, we are seeing a situation where the muscle actually there's a uniform decrease in the density of muscle, and there's no peak in muscle density. Next, uh, for the connective tissue, uh, I focus mainly on the elastic tissue. This is uh, staining using Weigert elastic. Uh, at the renal pelvis, uh, we can see elements of the elastic tissue, 
interposed within the smooth muscle. Uh, and you can see uh, here the UPJ, we are having the elastic fibers are thicker and more distinct compared to those of the ureter uh, This is the rabbit. The muscularis is very compact. The, the, the elastic tissue is confined to the lamina propria. And the density was not that increased uh, coming from the renal pelvis into the UPJ into the ureter. Next. So again, here we see a similar pattern for the elastic tissue where we have a peak of elastic tissue at the UPJ. Next. So uh, the gross morphology, we're seeing that uh, there's a gradual transition. So externally, we cannot delineate the UPJ, uh, both in man and rabbit. Next. Uh, intraluminally, however, we're seeing that the UPJ in man is characterized by mucosal folds that are more distinct and characteristic for the ureter. This was a simple observation was made by Shafiq and, um, and Murakumo, and they described this as being an eternal rosette. Uh, and this is in keeping with a uh, sphincteric function. As you see other sphincters of the body, such as the anal sphincter, the lower spatial sphincter, they have distinct longitudinal folds, because of folds, which aid in the sphincteric functions. However, in the rabbit, these because of folds were not distinctive for the for the for the, for the PUJ. Next. Uh, in the smooth muscle organization, in man, we saw uh, circular smooth muscle hypertrophy. This is in keeping with the sphincteric function. Further, in the rabbit, we, we saw a diminishing proportion of smooth muscle. This is uh, a, a difference that we noted. Uh, Gosling and Dixon alluded to a similar observation in 1971. Uh, so, uh, further, uh, sphincteric function, as I said earlier, is in keeping with sphincteric function. Um, so, the elastic fibers. Uh, the PUJ, as I said, is a transition from a wider lumen into a narrow lumen. So there's quite a bit of uh, turbulent flow there. And the gradient of elastic tissue may explain this and may even help in the, in the sphincteric function acting as a recoil. So in conclusion, the PUJ in man uh, exhibits sphincteric properties. However, in the rabbit, these sphincteric features are not discernible. Therefore, the choice of animal models in uh, in trying to find out the cause of uh, functional structure at the PJ, the rabbit or any other unicalisio mammal may not be the best choice. However, the other smaller mammals that have multicalisio kidneys that may be better choices. Thank you.